Uh, we are going through an interesting sermon series, at least by my estimation. Uh, when we planted this church, it started with just nine people. Uh, we met for five Sundays in a row, November of 2020, just nine people, well, it was not nine people, nine adults, and then children as well, um, obviously. <laughs> Uh, there's going to be kids involved. There has been from the beginning. Uh, and we met and we had five conversations those five weeks. And, and now we're taking those and we've called this sermon series Ancient Beginnings. We're, uh, we're putting them into a kind of a sermon series. Now, ancient, 2020 is not ancient. So what, what kind of sermon title is that? A sermon series title is that? Well, uh, it's, it will come as a shock to none of you. It should come as a shock to none of you. The church itself, right? Like we're not doing anything new. Yeah, right? Like the name Mercy Village Church might be new, but, but Jesus' church is not a brand new thing. It has ancient roots that go back even to the very, very beginning that this has always been God's plan. So that's where that sermon title comes from. I do want to say this, that today's talk, this isn't normal here at Mercy Village Church. What normally we do is uh, something called expository preaching, which is like a million dollar phrase, but it simply means that we normally open up books of the Bible and we preach through them verse by verse by verse. And even within this sermon series, which is somewhat topical, uh, we might jump from passage to passage, but when we get to those, the, those passages, we preach through those passages verse by verse. That is almost exclusively what happens in the, in the preaching style of this church. It's just a, a choice, a conscious choice that we have made as the leadership of this church. So that's how we will uh, preach Scripture, is, is verse by verse. But every now and then, uh, it might sound like a TED Talk. It's very rare, but today's that day. At, at this talk that we had back the second Sunday that we ever met in, in 2020, it, not a good TED Talk either, so don't like, get excited if you like TED Talks, but uh, we're, we're going to certainly be in the Word of God, and it's going to shape everything that we're talking about. But we don't have a specific passage that we're hammering in on. We're going to jump kind of to different verses throughout Scripture to make that point today. So you've been warned. We'll see how it goes together. It was a lot easier. I thought this week more than with any of these other conversations that we had. I'm like, this has been kind of the hardest one to kind of shape into a, like a sermon. It just was easier when it was just the nine people. But it's my prayer that it's, it's good for us today, uh, just like it was back then. If you've ever been to the doctor before, possibly maybe you've had this experience where you get on the scale and it shows up and it says like 77 or like 86 and you're like, whoa, what? That's, I mean, I've lost a ton of weight. And then you look at the little uh, measurement thing and, and it's a kg instead of an lb, right? Kilograms, different. That just doesn't mean the same thing. So it's, or if you've ever traveled to a foreign country, kilometers per hour is different than miles per hour. You might see this speed limit looks like, are we on the Autobahn, right? Like this is like a massive speed limit, but no, it's just a different form of measurement, okay? And Americans, you know, in typical American fashion, when no one else uses pounds or miles per hour, we've just stuck with it, right? I guess we're just loyal to those measurements. That's great. But my point three years ago, my point today is, if we don't measure by the right measurements, in particular a church or a life that's lived with Christ, so individually, if we measure with the wrong measurements, uh, as a church, if we measure success by the wrong measurements, we'll get out of whack very, very quickly. If you think 100 kilometers an hour means 100 miles per hour, you're going to get a speeding ticket in another country because it's going to get out of whack real fast. And so what I want us to think about on both levels, I want us to think about it individually, and I want us to think about it as a church, is how do we measure success? You see, we're all in danger of measuring it in, in different ways. And if I'm really vulnerable, and this was very true three years ago. As this church was being planted, there were a lot of people in our corner graciously and kindly standing with us, but there were a few 
very important voices that were saying the opposite. There were voices that were echoing in my head, and people that were close to us. Again, it was not the overwhelming message, but, but it was a message from certain people that said, hey, you can't do it. It'll fail. You'll wrap this thing around a tree. Your wife's a liability. And you're a C-plus church planter. Those boy, people said those things. When it looked like we kind of staggered and the church plant wasn't going to happen, there was a couple who's a part of our core team now who sat with one of those people, and, and it looked like the church plant wasn't going to happen. And that person said to them, uh, man, you really dodged a bullet to not be a part of Mercy Village Church. And those things hurt, like deeply. Those are deeply wounding things. And, and what, a, what a person can do, someone wired especially like me, is be like, well, I'll show you. Watch this. Right. And you can't plant a church that way. Like a kingdom measures of success, and, and I tell you that not for sympathy or, or not to like say something real juicy. Everybody's like, who was it? Who did doesn't matter. It doesn't. It doesn't matter who said those things. All that matters is that in my heart, I have been tempted from the drop to measure the success of this church in ways that are not the ways of the Bible, not the ways of the kingdom. Maybe you've got thoughts, words, ways of measuring the success of your life. They're out of step with how the kingdom measures success. Here's what we'll see today. When our identity is rooted in Christ, when our identity is rooted in Christ, success is defined differently. It absolutely is, and we have to believe that as a church, and we have to believe that as individuals. It mattered that we had that right from the beginning three years ago, and it matters that we have it right today. In a world laden with comparison and competition, and we, right, and this church is still young. We're still building it out. And so we have this chance to build it out uh, live and in person. If we try to build on the foundations of comparison or, or competition or, or whatever faulty measures we might have, it, 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 can, it can go bad really, really quickly. But when our identity is rooted in Christ, success is defined differently. So might. Our identity as individuals, like you sitting in that seat as a person, and our identity as a church be rooted in Jesus, and that we define success His way, not, not our way. And that's where we're headed today. Father, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. First, what I want us to see is that kingdom success is defined differently than we would ever expect it to be if we didn't know Jesus. Here's just a few examples. The Scripture's filled with reminder after reminder of how the kingdom measures success. Matthew 20, verse 16, simply says this, So the last will be first, and the first will be last. That's not normal. It's different. The Bible will say that last place is first place. Ricky Bobby's dad didn't agree with that, but... Some of y'all don't get that. That's fine. <laughs> Most of the world does not agree with that. But Jesus says the way to success is to get to the end of the line, not the front of the line. He'll tell us, Jesus in his ministry will say, giving pays more dividends than saving. It's, what? Again, that doesn't make sense. He'll, he'll say sacrificial service is the status symbol of choice in the kingdom. He'll tell us that losing our lives is the, the way that we save them. Kingdom, the kingdom of God measures success differently than the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers, sisters. 
Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. They could have been insulted by that, maybe. You tell me. And, and now notice he doesn't say all of you. There probably were some w- wise folks there. There were some with power and influence. There were some who maybe were of noble birth, but the vast majority, and it's the way God works. We'll see why just the, as we read the rest of these verses. Is, is he brings in people from the margins. I'm one of them, knuckleheads. I'm a knucklehead. God uses knuckleheads. He, but God chose what is foolish, verse 27, in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. And here's the reason, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you, child of God, are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. He became our wisdom, our strength, our power, our nobility. Righteousness, our sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. See, kingdom success doesn't get Pastor Paul glory. Kingdom success doesn't get you glory. Kingdom success brings glory to God. The, the measure of a successful church, the measure of a successful life is it brings glory to God. That's a different way of measuring success than how the world normally does. It's different. Foolish things are kingdom things. Right? Like when God uses a knucklehead like me, right? Like, like if he gave us someone brilliant, someone compelling, someone with a like extreme just skills and talents and everything to lead this church, then, then we could all be like, well, that guy's just a really great leader. But God gave you me, okay? There's a reason for that, so that he can get the glory. And the more you get to know me, the more you'll be like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> God gets the glory. It's a different way of measuring success. Uh, Titus 3, 4 through 7, I love this one. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. Like the initiative of God wasn't based on our works. God wasn't sitting up there waiting to send Jesus until we got our act together, thankfully. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The greatest riches are free. That's the kingdom measure of success. The greatest riches are free. Free to us. Because Jesus paid for them with his life. We, we could go on. There's, there's far more, many more passages that, that remind us of the upside down nature of the kingdom of God, that it's, that it's different than what we would expect, that the kingdom of God measures success differently, that kingdom units of measurement are different than those of the world. And most of us know that in our heads. We get it. Okay, the kingdom measures success differently, but, but I don't always live like I believe it in my heart. We must believe it in our hearts. As individuals, we must believe in our hearts that the kingdom measures success differently than the world. And as a church, we must believe that. So four years ago, I gave us three concerns. This is where it sounds like a TED Talk, probably. I gave us three concerns and and four statements. This time, I want to give us four concerns and four statements because you all have gotten worse. I'm just kidding. Um, It's a joke. But the first one is is a new one. It seems pertinent to me. This is concern number one for us as a church, for us as individuals. Might we refuse to build Mercy Village Church in our own image? We refuse to build our lives in our own image. 
but instead in the image of God as we see in Christ. My wife and I have said this, and, and, and other leaders here as well have heard me say this, that, that you could build the church that Barbersville wants easier than you can build the church that Barbersville needs. That's true with any church, anywhere. All you would have to do is go into a community, see what they idolize, see what they value, see what they desire the most, see what consumes them, and then just take those things and kind of sprinkle a little bit of religion on them and give it back to them. And they'd probably be like, I love this place. This is great. But to give a place the church that they need, we have to submit ourselves to this book. We have to study the person and life of Jesus Christ. We have to listen to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And, and sometimes we do things that are in tune with culture, and sometimes we do things that are out of tune with culture. Sometimes people say, man, I love that church. Look what they're doing in the community. And sometimes people say, did you hear what they're preaching over there at Mercy Village Church? No. That's the course of those who follow Jesus. You want to build your life, build your life in the image of Jesus. And as we build out this church, might we build out this church in the image of Jesus? To do that, we, we must be chained to the Word, submitting ourselves to this book as we know Jesus through it. We must be constant in prayer Submitting ourselves to the leadership of the, of the Holy Spirit. Might we see Jesus build this church? I'm saying that almost three years later. We said it three years ago. Still, the deepest desire of my heart is that Jesus will build this church. Not us. He'll use our hands and our feet to do it, by the way. But it'll be His church. Jesus has to be the head of the church, by the way, for it to, to actually be a real church. I hope you know that. Here's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And he, God, the Father, put all things under his, Jesus' feet. God the Father, that's an that's a, that's authority statement. God the Father put all things under Jesus' feet and gave Jesus as head over all things to the church. So he's, not, so he's ahead over all things. He gave him to the church. By the way, the church is included in all things, as are all things. So it is, he's the head of this place, the head of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who, who fills all in all. If Jesus isn't the head of this thing, if he's not the authority of this thing, then this is not a church. I think sometimes pastors and leaders can forget that. It's easy for humans to forget that and to build our lives the way we want to instead of the way Christ wants us to. So concern one, might we refuse to build out Mercy Village Church, to build out our lives in our own image. Instead, might we build them to look like Jesus. Concern two, might we refuse to, de to define success by our public perception and instead define success by our private investments. We refuse to define success by our public perception and instead define success by our private investments. I don't know if you remember the story Jesus tells in the Gospels of two people praying. One's like a religious bigwig and, and the other is this lowly guy. And as the scene plays out, it would appear that, that they're kind of in eyesight and earshot of each other because the holier-than-thou man stands up and he prays really loud, and he says, God, thank you so much. For what? That I'm not like this guy over here. Thank you that I'm not like this poor, wretched soul over here who's hiding in the corner, praying in a whisper, and got tears in his eyes, but instead I'm, I'm holy and good and well thought of, and right, public perception mattered to him, even in the, his prayers. You, you, that, that prayer, by the way, came right out of his mouth, and, and when the sound waves ended, that was the end of the prayer. I, I promise you, it wasn't going any further than that. 
But over in the corner, there's a, a lowly man. He's weeping. He's quiet. He's not seeking attention. And he says, wretched man that I am, save me. Right. That's the posture of kingdom success, is, is people being desperate for the mercy of God, not feeling entitled, but instead feeling thankful. Sometimes devastatingly thankful. I do not deserve this, but yet I have it. What grace. Public perception is not a, a kingdom unit of measurement. Careful, please. We said this three years ago. It's still true today. Careful lest we desire people to think that this is the cool church or the it church, okay? We're not in danger of that yet, thank God. But maybe one day as things grow, we could be tempted by that. We might sit around and say the way that we do it at Mercy Village Church is the right way. The way we do it there is something special. Love your church, but you can love this church. You can be thankful for this church. That's beautiful. But to, to kind of believe that it's somehow like something that's never existed before, it's somehow this cool thing, that's right. That in a passion to be cool, we become cold to the passions of Jesus. Careful. Careful lest we do mission and ministry out in the community to be perceived as the good guys in the city or to be perceived as uh, you know, people who really care, and then that puts us at the center of it. We want people to, to, to praise us instead of Jesus. We make the Great Commission transactional, quid pro quo. We'll, we'll live out the Great Commission as long as we get good press in doing it. Careful, unless we look back at dissenters or people who, who maybe say that, that the church can't make it and we, and we just focus on impressing them and with our gaze focused over our shoulder, we, we lose our way. Instead, might we invest privately, right? In the shadows, quietly. Not for the praise of man, might we go and do ministry selflessly? Not seeking a pat on the back, not seeking affirmation, but laying our lives down for others. My dad used to always say, we'll leave this place better than we found it. And then what my dad would do are about 98% of it things that nobody ever saw. He'd be cleaning the toilets. He'd be picking up the trash, and nobody saw it, and nobody praised him. Might we invest privately? Might we not be seeking the praise of man? Might we be selfless in our ministry? And might we walk with others, not in ways that are seen by everyone, but in ways that are intentional to each other? Concern number three, might we refuse to define success by comparison, but instead by compassion? Comparison could easily grow in any church, in any organization of any kind. We, we could begin to shape this church based on not being like those people. Well, that's silly the way they do it, or these are some bad memories I have from church, and I don't ever want to see that repeated again, so we're going to not be like that. Or we visit a really great church uh, over on vacation and we're like, well, we need to be like that. Or we see something on social media and we're like, we need to be like that. And we, and we build this thing on comparison, not thinking we're successful until we're better than them or better than that. Comparison will water down the fuel of Mercy Village Church. So Mercy Village Church is fueled by the way, by the gospel. 100%, it must be from the drop. The truth that Jesus died on the cross, was raised from the dead, and that he's the head of this church. That's our fuel. 
That's what will drive the engine of this church where we hope for it to go, where we need for it to go. Comparison will water down that fuel. Instead of it being about Jesus, it'll be about comparison. Comparison will drain the joy out of Mercy Village Church. Comparison will drain the joy out of your life, right? Sometimes your Instagram feed will make you depressed because you want your life to be, have you noticed this? You want your life to be like that, especially summer vacations, right? Especially, right, like, oh, why, ours wasn't like that at all. Man, my kids vomited in the car and, you know, like, it didn't look like that. It'll do the same for a church. Comparison will drain the joy out of the building of a church. Comparison will demagnetize the compass of our lives. Instead of our compass is pointing true north, which is towards Christ's likeness, towards walking with Jesus, it'll It'll point in a thousand different directions. We'll never know which way is up. We must be led by the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. Instead, Romans 12, 18 tells us this. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Okay, and that's rooted in what Jesus has done. Gospel peace. He's brought us into peace with God through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So now he says, with that as your compass, peace with God, with the finished work of Jesus on the cross as your compass, as your true north, now you live peaceably with other people. Be compassionate as we welcome others into this place. That anyone from any walk of life, from any demographic is is welcome here. We, We welcome others. And in doing that, we see Jesus. He welcomed me. Do you have any idea how radical that is? He welcomed you. Have you been honest about how radical that is? So we welcome others. We we live our lives out in this place. Concern number four, might we refuse to define success by how many people come into Mercy Village Church and instead define success by how many people go out from Mercy Village Church. We could fill this place to the brim, grow the crowds, but if lives aren't changed, what's the point? One of the ways you'll see that lives are being changed is that leaders will multiply, disciples will multiply, and churches will multiply. You'll see see people stand down, right, for the sake of intentional multiplication. You'll see other people get to preach from this pulpit. You'll see other people get to lead worship. You'll see other people get to lead kids' ministry. And sometimes, just like they said about me, we'll say, why does that guy get to preach? He doesn't have a clue what he's doing. That's the cost of growth, multiplication. That person's not as good with the volunteers as that last leader we had. That's the cost. And right, if we commit ourselves to the sending out of people, the multiplying of disciples, the multiplying of leaders, the multiplying of churches, then we'll measure success differently. Success won't be that every single aspect of a Sunday morning is super comfortable, but instead success of a Sunday morning will be that people are growing and being transformed and becoming leaders and becoming disciples of Jesus and churches are being planted. We'll invest our money in that. We'll invest our time in that. We'll invest our energy in that. We'll take risks for the sake of that. Four concerns. I'll read them one more time. And and the four statements are just going to be read. So you're like, oh man, how much longer? Just stay calm. Might we refuse to build out Mercy Village Church in our image? Concern one. Might we refuse to define success by our public perception and instead by our private investments? Might we refuse to define success by comparisons, but instead by our compassion? And might we refuse to define success by how many people go out from or come into Mercy Village Church and instead by how many people go out from Mercy Village Church. Here's the statements. 
we still don't need permission to be the church. We are the church. In that room three years ago with nine people, it kind of felt like, what are we doing? Does this thing even deserve to be called a church? Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We don't need permission to live that out. We already have it through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Statement two, we're still not in competition with other churches. We never will be. We're not trying to be better. We're trying to be here. It's not a competition. And it never will be. Instead, we're in a fight against the darkness. Ephesians 6.12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over the, this present darkness, against spiritual workers of evil in the heavenly places. It's not a competition. I pray that you will always see in this church a willingness to co-labor, a willingness to prop up others, a willingness to help a willingness to walk alongside. Statement three, we're still not keeping score. We never will. Because Jesus already settled the score. He scored all the points needed. We don't have to score any church points. John 16, 33, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus wins. Statement four, we still don't define success by ourselves. Our success is defined by the Word of God and the God of the Word. Might that always be true. Here's the best news in that. It means we don't have to win because Jesus already did. That's the message of the gospel. That we, sinners, separated from the goodness, the family relationship, the forgiveness of God, completely separated from that by our sin, every one of us in that place. Right? God's for, for God so loved the world, you know it, that He gave His only Son. Into that predicament comes Jesus. Jesus is born and lives a perfect life without sin. He is the very Son of God, God with skin on. Fully God, fully man. He dies on the cross in place of me, death I deserved, in place of you, a death you deserved. And blood spills out of His hands and out of His feet. And the Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. So far in the story, I've done nothing to win I've done nothing to score any points. Neither have you. It's been the work of Jesus. And then he dies, and when he dies, he says, it is finished, meaning I've done all that it takes. I've scored all the points. I've won the, the game. I've, I'm the one who won. And then he dies. And three days later, the exclamation point comes as he walks out of the grave alive. So we as a church and we as individuals don't find ourselves in a deficit. Your life will get out of whack really fast if you're operating from a deficit. Instead, we have abundant love for us in Christ, for Christians. We have abundant grace. We have all of our needs supplied. All the promises of God are yes and amen for the children of God. And if you're not a Christian, you can have that today too. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. If you have any questions about that, I'd love to answer them, but here's where I'll end for us. One last, last measure of kingdom success, and that's to take on the yoke of Christ. We read kind of a, a sum-up version of it this morning when Destiny read to us, Matthew chapter 11, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says that. He doesn't say, come to me all you winners. 
Come to me, all you successful. You see, what I'll have you know is that some of those voices that spoke into my life, those negative things from the past, three years in, I'll tell you this, it's true. They were right about a lot of them. But you know what they missed? What Jesus can do. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I I am that person. Jesus says, I'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You want to be successful in your life? You want to be successful in the church plant, in a church plant or in building out a church? It starts very counterintuitively. You got to raise your hand and say, I'm weary. I'm broken. I don't have what it takes. My way is killing me. My way is bringing weariness. There has to be something else. And then you look to the yoke of Jesus, right? Like an oxen yoke. And there Jesus is on one side, side, the most ripped oxen you've ever seen in your life. So it doesn't matter how weak you are. You put that other yoke on and you walk beside him and you'll go exactly where he needs you to go. And exactly where he's promised you to go. And all you have to do is own that you're weary and heavy laden and broken and busted and that you need rest. Like where else are you going to go in this world? What, what job interview are you going to sit in where you plead your weaknesses to get there? Like, like, try going over to Barbersville Little League, bring your kid over there and say, I don't know anything about baseball. I, I, I couldn't even tell you what the difference between a volleyball and a baseball I don't know how to swing this thing, I don't, but I would love to coach the team. See if they'll let you coach the team. They won't. <laughs> Literally not in a billion years will they let you coach the team. God will call you son, daughter. He'll say, sit at my right hand in the kingdom to come. He'll say, I'm going to use your hands and feet to build the church. Plead your weakness. So if you're feeling weak today, weary today, and broken today, and inadequate today, guess what? That's the sweet spot. You're there. Because the kingdom of God defines success differently. When our identity is rooted in Christ, success is defined differently. So might we as a church... So my prayer from the start, refuse to define success like the world and keep coming back to this book, and keep coming back to the life of Jesus, keep coming back to the soft and tender voice of the Holy Spirit. And might that be how this church is built and might that be how our lives individually are built by kingdom measures of success. Father, today, I'm weary, I'm heavy laden, I'm trusting you, your promise of rest. Might we all? And Jesus, will you build this church, please? Will you keep building this church, please? What a ragged aggregation of souls we are in this room. We got our baggage with us. We got our inadequacies with us, and we simply plead the blood of Jesus. The Jesus who is making all things new has already begun that work in us, his children, and that every bit of success that Mercy Village ever has, that we as individuals will ever have, every single bit of it will be found only if Jesus leads us. So might we be led by you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.